Imagine playing Minecraft, but you can't wear any armor and aren't allowed to use any tools. Well, except for a pickaxe. Can you survive 100 days using only a pickaxe and in that 100 days beat the ender dragon? In today's video, we are going to be answering that question as I am going to be surviving 100 days of hardcore Minecraft with just a pickaxe. Before we get into the video, I would like to say that only 5% of the people watching my videos are actually subscribed, so if you do go on to enjoy the video, consider subscribing, it's completely free, and you can always unsubscribe if you don't enjoy the video. With that out of the way, let's get straight into this challenge. After spawning into the world, I immediately cut down my first tree. With the wood, I crafted a wooden pickaxe and then gathered some stone. The hole I gathered my stone from had a bunch of coal, which I took some time to mine. Once that was done, I did a bit of exploring and stumbled across a ruined portal that contained a golden apple. There was a large plains biome nearby, which was home to a ton of animals. I quickly set up shop, basically just a chest, crafting table, and bed, and then spent the rest of the day mining iron from the surface caves in the surrounding area. Day 2 started with a fight between me and a skeleton and spider. With my lack of armor or a good weapon, it definitely wasn't an easy fight, but I managed to take the mobs down without too much trouble. While my iron smelted, I chopped down one of the bigger oak trees. I'll tell you right now, this moment is the start of my hatred for mining trees with a fist instead of an axe. The iron I had mined the previous day went into crafting an iron pickaxe, flint and steel, and bucket. In case I didn't make it clear in the intro, tools and armor are off limits, but I am still able to use other items. Villager trading was going to be super important to my survival, so I packed up my stuff and then went looking for a village. My luck seemed to be pretty good as I quickly spotted one in the middle of the desert. To make things even better, there was a super cool shattered savanna biome right next door. Night was fast approaching though, so I rang the village bell and trapped all of the villagers in their houses. To start day 3, I raided the village chests and mined a bunch of the hay bales. Not being able to make a hoe meant that having a supply of wheat was super important. Once that was done, I did a little bit of exploring and discovered a desert temple. The loot within the temple was fairly average, but I was able to pick up a saddle and some horse armor, which would be super useful later on. There was also a ruined portal buried at the edge of the desert, which contained a golden pickaxe. I decided to set up my starter base in the village church, as it was the biggest and best looking building. Before going to bed, I also found another desert temple that had similar loot to the first. Now that I had some saddles, I was eager to find a new ride. It didn't take too long to find a herd of horses, and after systematically checking the stats of each one, I managed to get one with good jump and speed. To test out my new horse, I traveled to the closest mountain and began climbing. This also gave me a chance to collect a few spruce saplings, which had suspiciously good drop rates. By the time I arrived back at the village, the day was almost over, so I quickly converted a villager house to a stable for my horse. The beginning of day 5 was also spent repurposing the villager house. Once that was done, I planted and grew a giant spruce tree and then started chopping it down. I wanted to make an enchanting setup as soon as possible, so I built a sugarcane farm that would be loaded while I worked on projects around the village. These next three days are a Minecraft YouTuber's worst nightmare. Unfortunately, the recording for this play session was corrupted and all the footage was lost. And to make things even worse, I found my first diamonds on day 7. So before you go down to the comments and write something like, oh glitching out, you cheated and got diamonds, just know that the coordinates for those diamonds will be included in the description next to the world seed. Because I don't have any footage for these days, I'm just going to give a basic recap of what happened. Days 6 and 7 were spent mining, and as said previously, I found an 8 vein of diamonds. On day 8, I crafted my first diamond pickaxe, expanded the sugarcane farm, killed a wandering trader, and tamed a better horse. Now you're all caught up, so let's get back to the non-corrupted days. While taming horses, I caught a glimpse of another village hidden behind the shattered savanna. This meant that the first part of the day was spent stealing all of the village's food and hay bales. 
To continue my spree of evil, I hopped on my brand new steed and killed as many horses and cows as I could for leather. Day 10 was spent improving the villager house I was staying in. I didn't want to alter the build too much and the design was already pretty solid, so it was basically just a matter of adding a few details such as a trim and some texturing. The sugarcane had grown while I was working on my house, so I harvested it and then expanded the farm. After that, I crafted a lectern and started rolling the trades of one of the trapped villagers. Having to mine the workstation every time with my fist made the process much slower, but eventually, the villager turned into a librarian that traded mending books. Once I rolled the trade, I gathered all of my wood, made a fletcher, and then traded sticks until I had enough to lock in the mending trade. The next stage of my plan for survival meant traveling down into the mines and mining a bunch of obsidian. This obsidian was then used to make a portal on top of a nearby hill. Before entering the nether for the first time, I would like to remind you all that I have no armor and more specifically no gold armor so there would be nothing stopping a rogue piglin from instantly wrecking me. But it turns out that piglins were the least of my problems as I almost died to lava after coming through the portal. That would have been a pretty embarrassing way to die. After making the portal a bit safer, I spent the rest of the day mining quartz. The next two days were spent gathering materials for a melon and pumpkin farm. I needed a lot of iron in order to craft enough pistons, rails, and hoppers, so most of my time was spent in ravines, mining the iron veins within the walls. While climbing out of one of these ravines, I broke a piece of sand and almost died after the rest of it fell on top of me. As I was returning home from the trip, I stumbled across an acacia village, which I promptly looted. With all of the hay I collected, I wouldn't need to restock on food for a long while. Before going to bed, I put my iron into the furnace to smelt. To craft the rest of the items needed for the farm, I needed a lot more redstone, wood, and cobblestone. Gathering these materials took quite a while as the farm I was planning on building was very expensive in terms of resources. On day 20, I began constructing the farm. However, I had miscalculated the number of rails the farm required and had to head back into the mines to gather some more iron. While doing this, I got jump scared by a creeper and was left on half a heart. Half a heart, people. If I had been a quarter of a block closer to the thing when it exploded, you would not be watching this video right now. Luckily, I had somehow managed to survive the encounter. It seemed like the game wanted to give me a consolation gift as I found an axolotl before finishing mining. Now that all of the materials were finally collected, I was able to start working on the farm. I am using a design originally by Il Mango, which detects the plant stem growth with observers that activate pistons to harvest the melons and pumpkins. Just as I was about to plant the crops, I realized something. I didn't have a hoe to make the farmland to plant the seeds in. I had spent the past two and a half hours gathering materials and really didn't feel like having my work be for nothing. This was when I decided to make one exception in the challenge and make an iron hoe. To make things more fair, I threw my remaining two diamonds in the well as a form of payment. I promise that from now on, no other tools than a pickaxe are used throughout this challenge. Other than the farmland incident, the farm building went fairly smoothly and before long, I had finished my first big project of the challenge. To start day 25, I added a few decorations to the farm in order to make it a bit more presentable. Once that was done, I found a building with three trapped villagers inside and turned them into farmers. Using the wheat from the village raids, I was able to lock each farmer's trades in and level them up to the point where they would buy pumpkins and melons. The prices that they were buying the fresh produce for were on the expensive side for now, but I had a solution for that. Day 26 was spent mining for resources. The trip was fairly successful and I even managed to find some diamonds. During the farm construction, my sugarcane had grown so I harvested it and then crafted the materials for a full level 30 enchanting setup. To make things simple, I built the enchanting setup in a villager tower across from my house. I had accrued over 30 levels from the villager trading and mining, so I enchanted my pickaxe and got silk touch. After doing a little bit of trading with the farmers, I was able to buy a mending book from the librarian. The extra mining trip had also given me enough iron to craft an anvil, which I used to add mending to my pickaxe. 
With the farm complete and the farmer set up, it was time for me to find a nether fortress. Unlike previous worlds where I had full iron or diamond armor to protect me, this time I had to be a lot more careful to avoid an untimely demise. While looking for a fortress, I came across a bastion, which could be a good challenge if I decided to continue the series. Towards the end of day 29, I caught a glimpse of nether brick poking out from the wall of the nether. My goal for this trip was to collect enough blaze rods to do a few villager conversions and craft the Eyes of Ender, so I navigated straight through the blaze spawner and saved the loot chests for later. After finding the blaze spawner, I walled myself off and created a sort of mob grinder to farm the blazes. My methods for gathering the rods were highly inefficient, unconventional, and time consuming, so it took over 30 minutes to gather enough. The grinding was also very dangerous, and there were numerous times where one more hit would have ended me. Day 31 was spent creating a tunnel from the fortress to my base for future adventures. I actually found a piece of ancient debris while mining, which was super rare for the Y level I was on. My time in the nether had been stressful to say the least, so I decided to take a day to calm down and relax. To start off, I hopped on my horse and gathered mushrooms from the nearby swamp. Once the mushrooms were collected, I returned home and brewed my first weakness potions. I also crafted some golden apples to use with the potions. The last thing I did before going to bed was capture a husk for the villager curing. Although I wasn't planning on transforming the village I was living in like my normal 100 days world, I did still want to make it look a little bit custom. The first step of this customization was improving the paths. With the paths complete, I grabbed my potions and golden apples, headed over to the farmer's house, and began the conversions. The process actually went super smoothly, and before long, I had three brand new emerald generating villagers. This new setup was capable of making around two and a half stacks of emeralds per day, which was more than enough for my needs. After doing a little bit of trading, I returned to my house and spent the night AFKing for more pumpkins and melons. Trading with the villagers was also a great way to get a bunch of experience. Using this method, I was able to enchant another pickaxe that I combined with my original and a mending book to make a fully maxed out silk touch pickaxe. The next three days were spent on an adventure looking for moss as I wanted to make a garden in the village but didn't like the color of desert grass. My plan was to loot shipwrecks which have a 40% chance of containing moss. While looking for a shipwreck, I came across two submerged amethyst geodes. The first of these geodes was safe, and I was able to gather the amethyst shards easily. The second one was… well, let's just say that I didn't go in the second one. On day 37, I mined my first dripstone, and found an ocean monument that I was definitely not ready to raid. Before returning home, I found a ruined portal, which contained an enchanted golden apple. There was also a shipwreck nearby, which sadly did not contain any moss. I did however get to dig up some buried treasure, so things weren't all bad. After traveling back to the village, I crafted a spyglass using the amethyst from the geode and two ingots of copper. To start day 39, I grabbed a smithing table and converted one of the villagers in the Fletcher's house to a toolsmith. The only trade that I was interested in from the toolsmith was the diamond pickaxe trade. This would allow me to basically turn emeralds into diamonds, which is something that I'm always up for. Once maxed, the toolsmith traded fortune 1 diamond pickaxes. I quickly bought 4 of them to get fortune 3, and then spent the rest of the day mining dirt for the garden. Unfortunately, because I was unable to find any moss, the brown desert grass was going to have to do. The main purpose of this garden was to add a splash of color into the otherwise plain desert landscape. I didn't want to spend a ton of time working on the garden, as I had other projects I needed to complete. This meant that it was not super detailed, but I did take the time to make a semi-custom tree and plant some flowers. To start the day, I used a few ingots of iron to repair the village iron golem. After that, I traded with the villagers for experience, and used that experience to add mending to my other pickaxe. I also tried to make a rudimentary villager breeder that ended up making a total of zero villagers throughout this entire challenge. By combining the Fortune 1 pickaxes I had bought from the toolsmith previously, I was able to make a Fortune 3 pickaxe, which I added to my regular efficiency pickaxe. Other than that, I spent the whole day chopping trees for wood. 
The next three days were spent mining Deep Slate for the next big project of the video. I wanted to keep the pumpkin and melon farm loaded while doing this, so I set up a separate mine closer to the village. This also gave me the opportunity to mine a bunch of different Deep Slate ores, which I plan on using later in the video. In the three days that I spent mining, I gathered around a chest and a half of Deep Slate and found 22 diamonds. I'd call that a pretty good haul. All of the deep slate mining had worn down my pickaxes, so I spent some time trading with the villagers to repair them. After that, I brought the deep slate up from the mine to the future build site. Days 47 to 49 were spent building the outline for the entrance of my main base. My plan for this base was to create a giant dwarven style entrance in the site of the shattered savanna biome, which would lead to my storage room. The door was going to be around 30 blocks tall, which meant that I had to be extremely careful while building, as falling off of the top could lead to my death. Once the outline was complete, I returned to the deep slate mine and mined a bunch of regular stone. The beginning of day 50 was also spent mining stone. I made sure to keep the pumpkin and melon farm running during the mining, so I had plenty in the collection system to use to top off the durability of my tools. After finishing the villager trading, I returned to the base entrance and cleared the area for the next step. Using the stone from the mining session, I began filling in the outline with a mixture of stone and stone bricks. I personally think the deep slate, stone, and stone bricks all work really well together, and once the actual door is installed, this entrance is going to look super nice. On day 52, I spent a little while scouting the nearby area for good caves to mine copper. While doing this, a wandering trader decided to come visit, and to my surprise, he was actually selling something useful. I quickly grabbed some emeralds and after a few quick trades, small drip leaf and a few buckets of pufferfish were now mine. However, just because the wandering trader was selling something good, didn't mean I could let him live. Using my professional persuasion skills, I lured the trader and his llamas into a hole and then let the pufferfish loose. One of the buckets of water actually caused the sand roof to fall down, so the trader had to deal with a bunch of pufferfish and suffocation at the same time. For once, I almost felt bad for them. But seriously, look at these prices. You can't forgive someone for prices this bad. Why? These next five days were spent mining copper. I needed around three stacks of blocks for my next project, which meant that I had the job of gathering over 25 stacks of raw copper. Luckily, with the fairly recent release of Minecraft 1.17, I was able to fortune ores that I had been previously unable to. Despite this fact, I still had to visit multiple caves as there just wasn't enough copper to mine. Spending so much time in the caves was also dangerous as I had no armor to protect myself. Just take a look at this clip. All it took was a few skeleton shots and I almost died. At one point, I also almost got assassinated in my sleep by a husk with an iron sword. Those things hurt. Other than that, the mining went smoothly and on day 57, I was able to return home and start smelting. Unfortunately, mining the copper was only the first step. In order to prepare the copper for the build, I needed to first smelt it and then lay it out to oxidize. Because of the sheer volume of raw copper, this was not a fast step. To pass the time, I also traded with the villagers and AFK'd overnight to oxidize the copper quicker. The copper was taking a very long time to oxidize, so I decided to get on with the building of the storage room. As you can probably see from the day counter, this took a very long time. I wanted to make sure the storage room was as good as I could make it, so I spent longer than usual planning out the design. Instead of building a large and extravagant room similar to my regular 100 days world, I chose to change things up a bit and try something new. I had seen some other YouTubers build smaller storage rooms in order to make all of the chests more accessible, which I thought was a great idea. To keep the block palette similar to the entrance, I used a mixture of deep slate and stone as the main blocks. On day 66, I took a small break from building to gather a bunch of calcite and smooth basalt from the geodes I had visited previously. My plan was to use the smooth basalt to make the entrance more textured and use the calcite in combination with some diorite for the floor. That's right, I'm building with diorite. I finished building the storage room on day 69. Now, all that's left to do is place the chests in. Unfortunately, this meant I had to mine another giant spruce tree with my hand. 
I feel like this gets more painful every single time I do it. However, it was worth the pain as I now had an awesome new storage room to keep all of my stuff. During the building process, the majority of my copper had finally oxidized, so I spent the first part of the day gathering it up. For those of you who haven't figured it out yet, my plan was to build the door of my base completely out of oxidized copper. Originally I was going to use strip dark oak wood instead, but I don't have an axe to strip the wood, so that didn't work out. After installing the first part of the door, I spent the rest of the day and night AFKing to farm more pumpkins and melons, and oxidize the copper. Making the entrance out of copper had given me some redstone-y industrial vibes, so I decided to make a 3x3 piston door as the entrance to the storage room instead of a manual boring wooden one. The first part of the day was spent gathering materials for this door. While doing this, I also traded with the farmers for experience. I needed a bit of slime to make some sticky pistons, which meant that it was off to the swamp for me. Overall, the slime hunting was going very smoothly until tragedy struck. As I was retreating from a big slime, I made a wrong step and fell into a ravine. I really didn't want to lose this world, so I actually left the game and strategized in a creative world on how to survive the fall. My plan was to quickly dismount my horse and water clutch on the floor of the ravine. I'll let you see what happens next. I had lived to tell the tale, but my horse had sacrificed itself in the process. After returning to the village, I gathered more of the oxidized copper and added it to the door. The last enchantment I needed to max my pickaxes out was efficiency 5, so I bought a few extra diamond picks from the toolsmith, enchanted them, and then combined one with my fortune pickaxe to fully max it. Now that all of the materials were collected, I started working on the 3x3 piston door. I am using a design by Phoebe. The link will be in the description below if you want to check it out. I have absolutely no idea how this thing works, but it works, so I'm not going to question it. The only thing that I actually made for this door was a note block activation system, which I'm actually really proud of. To make it work, I had to build a pulse extender and a redstone torch tower. That's more redstone in two days than I would normally do in two months. While building the door, I had also brainstormed ideas on what kind of memorial I wanted to make for my horse. It isn't super often that a Minecraft pet saves the player from death, and I felt a simple gravestone wouldn't be enough. Instead, I decided to make a giant stone horse statue on top of one of the nearby desert hills. I'm not very good at building organic structures, but I tried my best to make the build look at least a little bit like a horse. You can tell me in the comments if I succeeded or not. On the pedestal of the memorial, I placed a chest and laid the fallen remains of the horse within. However, just because I made a memorial for my horse did not mean all the other horses were safe. My storage room needed a bunch of leather for item frames, and hey, whether leather comes from a cow, llama, or horse, it's still leather. The leather collection continued into day 79. Without looting 3, I needed to harvest the leather from a lot more animals compared to if I had a sword with the looting enchantment. After returning home, I crafted the item frames and placed them on all of the chests. Another thing I like about this storage room configuration is that only half of the double chest is covered up by the item frame, which makes it a lot easier to open the chest. Without an ender chest or shulker boxes, moving my items from the starter house to the storage room was a big pain. I didn't even have that much stuff, only around 3 double chests of items, but having to walk all of the way to the shattered savanna biome made it seem like way more. On day 83, I added a few more copper blocks to the door. At this point, the only pieces of copper that still needed to oxidize were the stubborn stragglers who were stuck at the first or second stages. Once that was done, I made one of the remaining villagers into a cleric and then traded with him until he traded enderpearls. For some reason, it did not occur to me that I could simply craft an ender chest until after all of the item transportation. To make up for the mistake, I crafted one using a purchased enderpearl and stored some of my utility items in it. 
So far, I had managed to collect every type of Deep Slate Ore, except for the Emerald variant. It was time for that to change. I knew that Emerald Ore could only be found in mountain biomes, so I traveled to the nearest one, dug down, and then started mining. My strategy was to strip mine at Y12 in areas with lots of Deep Slate. By doing this, I could guarantee any Emerald Ore I found was Deep Slate and maybe get a few diamonds in the process. It took a while, but eventually, I caught a glimpse of shiny green amid the dark grey of the Deep Slate. Placing the piece of Deep Slate Emerald Ore into its place in the storage room felt awesome. For the first time, I had managed to collect every type of Deep Slate Ore in the game. With that out of the way, I placed some more copper into the door and traded with the villagers for experience. I was getting pretty close to the end of this challenge, which meant that it was time to do something I had been putting off for a while. Ancient Debris Mining. I had some TNT in my chests from the desert temples, so I grabbed it and then traveled to the nether. Once there, I dug down to Y15 and began mining. Unfortunately, blowing up the nether did not yield any debris, so I had to turn to manual digging. Surprisingly, doing this was actually much more effective, and I was able to find the 8 pieces of debris I needed in one day. Back at the storage room, I placed my debris into the furnace to smelt. Once it was done smelting, I crafted 2 netherite ingots and converted my pickaxes to netherite. If you think about it, I now have completely max gear in this world. The front of my base was looking very messy, and I wanted to do some terraforming to fix it. I didn't have enough time to do anything super complicated, so I decided to just make a small desert cliff to give the entrance a little bit more of a foundation to stand on. It had been a while since I had done any major terraforming, and I had fun experimenting with a new build style. On day 90, I returned to the nether in order to gather netherwort for potion brewing. Instead of traveling through the open nether, I was able to use my tunnel to get to the fortress which was super convenient. When I got to the fortress, I was greeted by a bunch of fortress mobs and almost died after being hit by a wither skeleton. That would have been a pretty embarrassing way to go. Almost immediately after escaping the mobs, I was awarded with the Hot Tourist Destination Challenge, which was more than a little bit surprising. I didn't want to push my luck, so I navigated to the portion of the fortress with the nether wart, harvested a bunch, and then left as quickly as I could. I did however take the time to loot some of the chests, and one of them contained a piece of diamond horse armor which would be very useful. To start the day, I gave the diamond horse armor to my remaining horse. This would give the horse more protection, and maybe protect it from an untimely demise like my previous one. I had a few pieces of TNT left, so I rode to the nearest mountain and began blowing up the area. This was because I needed snowballs. Unfortunately, I was not able to craft a shovel, so the only way I could get snowballs was from TNT explosions. I wanted to tackle one last building project before fighting the ender dragon, and the axolotl in my pocket had begun looking a little bit sad. To fix this issue, I decided to build a desert oasis next to the village where my axolotl could live. The hardest part about making this oasis was having to dig out the area for the lake by hand. I was able to make the process a little bit faster using the torch trick, but it was still quite tedious to do without a quicker means of digging. Other than that, it was just a matter of making the place look more alive using a mixture of plants, grass, and a few palm trees that provided shade to the area. The oasis was finished on day 96, which meant that I could finally give my axolotl a new home. Make sure to leave a comment with hashtag axolotl and your name suggestions and I will pick one if I decide to continue this series into 200 days. After spending some time hanging out at the oasis, I began brewing potions for the ender dragon battle. I brewed a combination of strength and invisibility potions, which would help me to stay hidden from the dragon and enderman. The strength potions would be used to maximize the amount of damage I did while the dragon was perching as I had no ranged methods to attack with. Once all of the preparations were finished, I threw my first eye of ender and began my search for the stronghold. I found the stronghold at the beginning of day 98. I didn't have much time left in the challenge, so I dug down and tried my best to find the portal room in a timely manner. Luckily, the route to the portal room was fairly short, and I quickly found myself in the portal room, ready to fight the dragon. 
Without further hesitation, I lit the portal and did some last minute organization of my inventory. The day was almost over, so I decided to do the fight the next morning. This was going to be my hardest challenge of the 100 days by far. One good hit from the dragon and all my hard work would be gone. However, time was ticking down and I didn't want to waste any more of it. I hopped into the portal and drank my first invisibility potion. I've been commentating this entire video, so let's switch things up and do a montage. Enjoy! The dragon had been defeated, and I'd never felt more relieved. This had been by far the hardest Minecraft boss fight I have ever attempted, and the number of times I almost died was terrifying. Not wanting to spend any more time in the end, I jumped into the return portal and traveled home. Yes, I know, I forgot the egg, but you know what, I can always grab it later. As day 100 began, I was visited by a wandering trader. Of course, he was trading moss. It's almost like they knew it was my last day of this challenge. Using the last few blocks of oxidized copper, I traveled to the storage room and finished the roof. While doing this, I was jump scared by a creeper, but managed to dispose of it before anything destructive happened. The rest of the day was spent exploring everything I'd created in this video. Thank you all so much for watching 100 Days of Minecraft with just a pickaxe. If you enjoyed the video, consider hitting that like button and subscribing. But other than that, this has been Glitching Out. Goodbye everyone!